Hello and welcome. Welcome to all of those who are here in, in the classroom this evening, as well as welcome to the more than 100 uh, guests who are online tonight joining us for the lecture. My name is Lori Kalb Cosmo, and it is a great pleasure to introduce the presentation Art Amid the Ruins by art historian, journalist, and guest curator, Dr. Sandra Smets, who is beside me. Um, and we are here as part of the Leiden University Art History Department Museum Talks series. Art Amid the Ruins is the title of a current exhibition on view at the Depot Boymans von Bennigan and the result of years-long important research by Sandra on artists and public art in Rotterdam in the aftermath of the May 1940 bombing and subsequent five-year German occupation of the Netherlands. Installed in a fourth floor gallery of the depot's cup-shaped building, purposefully designed to display objects in storage, Sandra's exhibition presents a selection of the museum's holdings made by artists during the reign of the National Socialist Kunstkammer in the Netherlands and an ironically robust wartime art market. It succeeds a two, 2018 Boymans exhibition titled Boymans During the War, Art in the Destroyed City, which had a publication um, as well, to which Sandra also contributed and coincides with her recently published book, the Firebird Generation, Artists in a Destroyed City, which describes the lives of 10 Rotterdam artists during the war and the difficult choices they had to make. As we witness devastating destruction and loss in two current wars, in Ukraine and Israel-Palestine, the topic of Sandra's project is heartbreakingly prescient though even more necessary. It is also relevant to the history of Dutch museums. During the difficult interwar period of the early 20th century, particularly between 1935 and 1940, no less than five museums of modern art emerged in the Netherlands. Museum Boymans van Bennigen acquired a new building during this time and added modern art to its vast range of collections. Founders and directors of Museum Boymans van Bennigen and other Dutch modern museums ranged in their taste of new abstract forms and dealt vastly differently with the German occupation. All faced enormous difficulty difficulties during the Second World War, though their museums survived and were transformative. Over the past decade, some museums that emerged during this period, including Kunstmuseum Den Haag and Stedelijk Amsterdam, as well as Boymans, have examined their wartime history with, with pro, probing exhibitions and publications, along with provenance research and uh, addressing restitution issues related to Nazi looted art. Sandra Smetz's talk this evening on her current exhibition, Art Amid the Ruins, will no doubt deepen our awareness of this fraught political moment and demonstrate to us how cultural institutions remain critical, relevant, and indispensable spaces for reflection in many different contexts. I turn the floor over to you. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you, Lori, for that very wonderful introduction. Good evening, everybody. It's an honor to be here in the same building where I studied a very long time ago. Um, I'm very happy to give you an insight in my research I've been working on for the past three to four years, or maybe a bit more, all in collaboration with Museum Boymans van Beuningen. 
The research, the project, consists of a few parts that I will tell you all about. And one part is me being a guest curator of a presentation of work by Rotterdam artists. And because of that, I wanted to start by citing another guest, guest curator who worked for the same museum, artist Herman Bieling. Because as I stand before you now, in another time, Bieling also stood before a culturally interested audience also giving a speech. That was at Museum Boymans. And it turned out to be an optimistic speech. Nowadays, Bieling said, much more was being done for artists than ever before. He recalled the reign of no fewer than five mayors, and all the time Rotterdam had remained a materialistic city, which he blamed on art not having been seen as a governmental affair. That was different now, he said, and the artists who now kept their work at home, he would call malefactors evil, because it was precisely now that artists had to show their work to uplift the people. Times had changed, he said, a new era had dawned, and those artists had been well aware of this dawning of this new era. Bieling gave this speech at the opening of an exhibition of artists that he had organized in Boymans, which he did more often at the time, and he was very pleased that the government and Boymans were now finally paying attention to contemporary Rotterdam art. Because before it had been so different. Around Christmas 1929, artists like Bieling had held a protest exhibition on the steps of the city hall in Rotterdam and Bieling himself had addressed the mayor saying, I quote, the need is great, the cold is barren, a shivering child is begging for a handout, art is no luxury, but a social necessity. We have a right to exhibition space. Bieling thought the city did not do much for Rotterdam-based artists, and neither did the museum. And Bieling, not burdened with any sense of diplomacy, had previously sent cursing letters to Boyman's director, Dirk Hanema. But now, with Bieling giving this speech at the museum. Now there was no need for such angry letters. The dream had come true in the new order. But by now it was 1943. And that new order that was a national socialist order. The 70 artists who had submitted work to exhibit in the museum had all applied to the Kultuurkamer set up by a new National Socialist Cultural Department. So now that art could finally play a significant role in society, it turned out to be a fascist society. Or no, a largely anti-fascist society, but one in which an occupying power sought means to get the people on board with its own ideology, that of the new order. And one of those means was art. This is just one anecdote to show that Bieling lived in the absurd situation that during the occupation, the art world in Rotterdam became booming. That meant more artists than before, more exhibition opportunities, subsidies, more customers for art dealers, more commissions for artists, more everything. That growth is what my research is about. For the past years, I've looked into how the art world in occupied Rotterdam grew. And this research, in collaboration with the museum, led to a number of results. The book, an online city map, a research presentation in Boymans van Beuningen's depot building, complemented by crowdsourcing. And I will now, this hour, explain all those different parts. First, back to the start. 
The idea for this research dates back to 2018. Back then, as Laurie said, I was a guest curator of the exhibition Boimas During the War. That's a photo of the exhibition. It was an in initiative of the museum itself that felt it had to show its own complicated war past in order to be transparent about it. It is a complicated history because the museum director, Dirk Hanema, was arrested in 1945 for collaborating with the Nazis. He had managed to, kept, to keep the museum open during the war by keeping everyone on good terms and doing a lot for artists, but thus also by cooperating with the occupying forces and taking on high-ranking positions in the art world organized by the Nazis. So, in 2018, the museum set up an exhibition about its own war past, including a study on uh, looted art, uh, provenance, as the national survey on this was completed. Me, as a freelancer, I was involved to supplement the exhibition with stories about Rotterdam-based artists at the time back then. Um, amongst others, I created an arrangement with works by different artists who had experienced the war in different ways. One artist had started to paint the reconstruction, you can see him here, uh, here. <laughs> Um, the reconstruction of the city center. Another one had been a member of the Dutch National Socialist Union, NSB. A third artist had retreated to his studio. A fourth one went on to paint a grand wartime oeuvre with portraits of refugees. There was a Jewish sculptor and a communist artist who died in a concentration camp and also a few people, people who simply painted winter landscapes, which were painted ever so much at the time, because, again, art was in great demand. And this was because of German clientele that came to the city. It was because of Nazi art funding, and also because of the fear of inflation. The Dutch invested their savings in art. So, these different works pointed towards different stories that I couldn't really tell in the exhibition, because in an exhibition, text is limited. And therefore, the idea arose that this underexposed history, because that's what it was, would be worthy of a book. The opportunity to start writing the book presented itself, and the museum heard that the Mondrian Fund was launching grants because of 75 years of freedom. Together with the museum, I wrote a project plan, and in September 2020, I really set to work, starting with the book, the main part of the project. And just like in this exhibition, again, I wanted to put artists at the center, and again, I went looking for artists who exemplified different parts of history. And this idea is a so-called prosopography, or group biography, meaning each protagonist being exemplary of a larger group of artists. So several names ended up in the book, showing the width of the subject matter through the eyes of a few main characters. But that was not the only reason I put the artists at the center. I wanted to write a book that made art history come alive. Since I studied here in Leiden, in this same building, I've been working as an art historian and as a journalist, and therefore I find it important to write in such a way that the reader can connect to the story on a personal level. If in my book I had limited myself to describing the cultural infrastructure, it would be too abstract. But if I make it human through those artists, then hopefully the reader can empathize. And in that way, writing the book for me is similar, similar to how I usually write for NRC, uh, the newspaper that I'm connected to, addressing a wide audience. And it also applies to this book, which aims at art lovers, but also at people who are interested in 
either the war or in Rotterdam. And especially in Rotterdam, there are very many people interested in Rotterdam. Um, I started out with the idea of eight chapters for eight main characters. But during the writing, writing process, I found that there was too much overlap. I was better off with only five chapters, each with more depth. Now I will go through these five stories briefly, thus explaining this history and also my research process at the same time. The book did not become chronological because that would have been difficult to reconcile with the prosopography as these life stories take place simultaneously. Still, some chronological emphasis were possible. In the first chapter, I wanted to focus on 1940 and 1941, on how the city reacted to the bombing before the occupying forces really came to claim their power. After the raid, the Nazis were still busy with many other things, not arts, and in those in-between months, Rotterdam started to build dozens of little temporary buildings where duped shopkeepers could continue their businesses. And the municipality, not the Nazis, hired dozens of artists to decorate those shops with murals, sculptures, and signs. So, on the left you see the signs, and on the right you see Wim Chabot, a painter, uh, decorating one of those shops or cafes. Um, this grand art plan became a starting point for how art would develop further in Rotterdam with more commissions, fundraising events, etc. The leading character in my first chapter, chapter is this man, Wim Chabot, the younger brother of the more well-known Henk Chabot. But I chose Wim because his history coincides seamlessly with the story that I wanted to tell. Wim Chabot was one of the 50 artists who lost their studios or houses in the bombing. And then he was one of the artists hired to decorate those temporary shops. And I chose him after I got in touch with his daughter, who very kindly gave me her father's unpublished memoirs. And that was just what I needed. Because in his memoirs, Wim describes how he saw the ruins of the broken city, how he went looking in the ruins for a studio that he couldn't find, and how he thought and worried. And for me that was perfect, because he made the disaster a personal experience. And at the same time, I was able to sketch a portrait of the city too, yeah, of what was and would become. So, the first chapter is about Rotterdam's resilience during its first reconstruction, which started in 1940, not 1945. That's when the reconstruction started. And where painters and architects created a kind of painted illusion of a city. Comparable to how in the US, Las Vegas is a Fata Morgana in the desert. That's how in Rotterdam, a Fata Morgana a cardboard decor of a city arose amid a wasteland of ruins. The second chapter is about Museum Boymans, through the eyes of Herman Bieling, whom I mentioned earlier. Boymans was such an important place at the time that this naturally needed a chapter of its own. That had to do with Der Kanema. Immediately after the bombing, Hanema contacted the Ministry of Culture in The Hague for financial compensation for artists who had become homeless. He also helped with charitable activities and he commissioned seven artists, including Bieling, to enter the closed of city centre and document the ruins in art. Hanema continued to help artists and he asked Bieling to organise group exhibitions in the museum. So, this chapter deals with the exhibitions that Bieling made, with propaganda, and with the Kulturkamer. In 1941, the new culture minister visited Rotterdam, and that was the anti-Semitic National Socialist Toby Goedewagen. He chose Rotterdam to present his art plans, and he did so in Boymans. The plans for a national art policy 
and he talked about a structure based on medieval guilds with patrons and pupils, pupils, the structure which would become the Kulturkamer. That Kulturkamer is an administrative system erected by the Nazis to control the art world that became mandatory in 1942. So, from 1942 on, every artist who wanted to practice their profession had to register or lose access to the art world in uncertain times of war. For some it was also a great opportunity because the national funding for visual arts became eight times higher. So let that sink in, please. The Nazis multiplied the national art funding eight times. The art world as we know it today, financially, was built by the Nazis. I'm often asked whether the Nazis imposed censorship in Rotterdam, but the answer is no, not really. Which is different from Germany, of course, where abstract art was ridiculed in a major exhibition of Entartete Kunst, degenerate art, in Munich in 1937. There it was clear that Dada, Expressionism and Cubism were not accepted, but these guidelines did not reach occupied Holland. First of all, in Holland there was never such an exhibition as in Munich. And second, abstract art had already gone out of fashion. In the Netherlands and Rotterdam, most visual arts in the 1930s had become figurative, realistic, true to nature. Artists painted ordinary landscapes and still lives, which the Nazis did not object to. Why should they? And actually, these innocent paintings could also be fitted into a national socialist narrative. So art did not change, but the interpretation did. For instance, with landscape painting. That's the museum, 1935. Yeah. Um, Cheryl Kemper. Um, a painting made in 1942. Um, the Nazis said that this type of very ordinary landscapes were to be seen as national landscapes that expressed national character, showing the soil that artists came from as in blood on boden or blood and soil. According to the Nazis, that was something that a Jewish artist could never do because Jews were considered Bolshevists and urbanites or degenerates without being rooted in soil. Many painters disagreed with those interpretations. They didn't make political art. Yet this was the price to pay for continuing to exhibit in the open. And this was also because the press had immediately been Nazified in the summer of 1940. But it was in spe especially in 1942 that the Nazis really started occupying the art world by, again, funding the arts with subsidies and with exhibitions of their own. Building this network, the art world became tainted and slowly but surely art started losing its neutrality. Art became political in spite of what the artists wanted. It became embedded in propaganda. And as another art historian once said in another context, if art becomes propaganda, then propaganda becomes art and we all live in hell. So all this ended up in chapter two, which took me quite a long time to write. Um, and then, um, somewhat chronologically, I wrote a third chapter um, in the sense that it focuses on 1943, when a new local Rotterdam-based organization, a cu cultural affairs department, was set up under the leadership of, yet again, Boymans director Hanema. It opened with its own exhibition space in the Witte Street, 
And between art shows, there were two unmistakable national socialist exhibitions, as there were some in the museum too, heavy on the propaganda, with so-called information on race and ancestry. And yet, this new artist space was a big success. Thousands of visitors bought entrance tickets, saw the exhibitions, and bought artworks. A lot of artworks. Never before and never after there was a time in Rotterdam when people bought this much art. Which also had to do with the fear of inflation, because that had happened, of course, in Germany in, in the 1920s. So people wanted to invest their savings in something that would um, keep its value, um, which is often real estate or art, but real estate in Rotterdam hadn't turned out to be a great investment. Um, so. This third chapter is about that exhibition space, which was a showcase of this new department of Hanama's. It commissioned art in public space and for important buildings, taking over from City Hall, where the aldermen and officials had left in 1942, because then City Hall was Nazified. That meant an opportunity for Hanama, because the funds from the Hague, from the Nazis in the Hague, remained. So the Nazis had bombed the city and then they had invested a lot of money for the art to rebuild it. Making Hanama even more powerful as a director, but in the, in the end it was only on paper uh, because the system started crashing due to scarcity, bureaucracy and all over chaos. I wrote this part for the book through the eyes of Jaap Gidding, who made these two artworks. Gidding was a decorative artist who, like Hanema, enthusiastically joined the new order. During the interbellum, Gidding had been making luxury arts and crafts in Art Deco style. He also decorated Tuschinski's um, movie theaters. But as an old school craftsman, he had seen his commission portfolio dwindle in the 1930s when his luxury style went out of fashion. But now came the Nazis, who had the same interest in craft as he did. And so he actively contacted them and took up a position within the Kulturkamer in 1942. All in, 1942 was really the year that the war changed. That's the year that the Nazi army met Stalingrad. It was the year that propaganda plans grew big time. It was the year that the Nazis stopped pretending to be friendly, as they did before. And it was the year that the deportations of the Jews began. And then, with all this happening that year, I saw that the Kulturkamer also identified an urgent problem, being the current state of breakfast tableware. So, sometimes when writing, these schizophrenic times were quite unbelievable. And through Gidding, I tried to make sense of all this. I recount this, hint, this history through reports of Kulturkamer meetings that I found in the archives at the NIOT, the Dutch Institute for War Documentation, and through letters that Gidding wrote to a friend, letters in which he sinks more and more into a nostalgic past from well before the war, when life was so much easier. From the city, with its plans for public space, to the Museum Boymans, to this new um, institution and exhibition space, and to the Nazi art world. Up until now, this is a history that had been one of visibility. Even though this whole history has la later been forgotten, looked over, in retrospect, I noticed it was rather easy to reconstruct. The website Delphar, as you all know, I assume, a newspaper archive, showed me the, a shop window 
of that art world. There was an endless amount of articles and reviews. But meanwhile, when writing all this, I was in a strange situation, as we all were at the time, Corona. It was spring 2021. As you remember, an endless lockdown when archives and libraries were closed. Thankfully, I had Delver and the rest of the internet, and I bought a lot of books, secondhand, but still, it started feeling weird. There I was at home, all alone, all alone, figuring out all by myself what the Second World War had looked like. And even though I had many sources, it can help to peers and people. It can help to talk to peers and people about your ideas. So I needed human voices. And because of that, I switched to another story, history, the one of the Jewish artists. Their history cannot be traced through Delphar because they had been rendered invisible during the occupation. So I knew that I had to start looking for relatives and offspring to tell me the stories I could not find in online archives. And that's what I started doing at the end of that lockdown. Hearing stories, reconstructing people's lives through sometimes the smallest details. For example, I reached out to the family of Deborah Sanson, a Jewish artist who had lived in Rotterdam during the occupation. She's not well known, but that was yet another reason for me to look into it. Deborah Sanson started taking painting classes before the war and had an interesting artistic mother too, the choreographer Anna Sanson Katz. I spoke to relatives of Deborah Sansons and then the archives opened up again and I found her mother's name in connection with international anti-fascist protests from the 1930s. Deborah's grandson pointed me to Steven Spielberg's Shoah project. Spielberg had used the proceeds of his film Schindler's List late last century to interview numerous Holocaust survivors worldwide. And one of those interviews, on film, was with the brother of the Boras. So for hours, I sat in the Jewish Historical Museum in Amsterdam, watching such interviews. And so that hidden history gained visibility, at least for me. Through bits and pieces, I found names of artists whose existence has been completely forgotten. On Marktplaats, that's like a Dutch eBay, you can see it on the left, um, that's a work by Jacques Arendt that I bought for 80 euros. Um, and Jacques Arendt was a Jewish artist portraying Jesus in modern city life, crucified, cr crucified as a victim of anti-Semitism. So this is not a Christian Jesus, this is a Jewish Jesus. I got in touch with a cousin of Arends who pointed me at a document by the Central Intelligence Agency of the 1930s where Arend had been blacklisted as a left-wing extremist. He did not su survive the war. On the right, you see a drawing of a German cafe in Rotterdam, a Brauhaus, frequented by Germans and Dutch National Socialists which was painted by an artist who lived in a flat next door, so this was his view. And this artist was also Jewish, and he also didn't survive. During the lockdown, I had already found a lot of online databases, and simply a name like Cohen, huh? a painter, in the 1939 Rotterdam address book, gave me a lead to bring someone out of oblivion. So in a way, it was mind-blowing for me, because no one before had looked into this. When I started working on the exhibition in 2018, there was no information on Jewish artists at the time in Rotterdam. Now also, I was tipped off about a Jewish textile artist, described only briefly in a novel, enough to lead me to a complete history of a brave woman who had been in the resistance. And then later, when the archives did reopen, by accident, I stumbled upon the name of her sister-in-law, interior designer Jo Elvers, also a woman 
who had played a role in the later phase of the resistance. So that's how wonderful serendipity can work out. I saw a complete history emerging, a network too, but also with solo figures who were taken away on their own and murdered with their whole families and no one left to tell their stories. And however oppressive their lives had become and their living spaces made smaller and smaller by the occupying forces, the more I was able to link their stories to a larger Dutch and European story where, for example, it turns out that Winifred Wagner, a personal friend of Adolf Hitler's, ensured that one Jewish artistic Rotterdam-based family was spared the death camps. My prosopographical intent here succeeded in linking Rotterdam-based stories of resistance, hiding and holocaust through a number of main characters. And like I said, no one had been looking for this before. So for you art historians, really, there are so many more stories to be told or for you really to tell. The fifth chapter dealt with two artists who simply cannot be left out of the story of Rotterdam during the war. Ate Haas was arrested in Rotterdam in 1943 for exhibiting so-called degenerate art which became quite a riot and he was imprisoned. And the second one is Henk Chabot, this uh, painter, Rotterdam's best known artist. He has his own museum, now it's a museum park. And he made this passionate painting of the fire of Rotterdam caused by the bombing of May 1940. And then later in the war, he did a series of deep, deeply felt painting, paintings of refugees and hungry people and people in hiding. I didn't really know how to connect the Haas to Shabbat, but in the end I managed because of their mutual teacher, someone who taught students to go their own, go find their own personal styles. And in the previous exhibition, 2018, I had met someone, an artist, who had voice recordings of a few artists, which was wonderful because then I could hear them chatting and gossiping and whatnot which also gave the story a nice twitch, a bunch of self-willed characters going their own ways. Okay, so much for the book. Um, or maybe one last thing. Um, the editor and the publisher, which was also the museum, thought that that was a wrap. But I did want to add some extra story, um, an, an extra chapter on... The, um, the story of the war after the war uh, because officially the war ended of course in 1945 but then there was no room for trauma that people suffered especially in Rotterdam where reconstruction became key accompanied by a very happy and optimistic looking art murals and other monumental art started showing happy families animals, people in harmony with the world etc um, let's go the same goes for the development of modern art. Um, Rotterdam was given a slogan, stronger through battle, and strength and victory became synonymous with the city. Art, thus, once again, became part of a larger narrative, though a different one this time. And that's what I find so interesting, that art's always part of society. Okay, so much for the book. Um, now I want to get back to the overall project. As I said, it consists of four elements. A book, an online map, crowdsourcing, and a presentation in the depot building. I specifically say presentation, not exhibition, because that distinction is important to Boymans. Exhibitions were made in the museum, but the museum is closed. The depot building has space, but it is a building for collection and research not for exhibitions per se. So, if you show art, it should be about collection and research. But how? The depot opened in 2021 and was so new at the time, one of a kind, that they had to develop a new way of using space in relation to research. So what do you do? Do you highlight a few works from the collection? 
do you organize an event for the general audience or specific guests? And although I was mainly guided by the wonderful expertise of the people at Boymans, who are the best experts, really, I was also inspired by a research presentation here in Leiden, which was an eye-opener for me. Uh, one day, for fun, I went to the Wereldmuseum here in Leiden, and near the station. And at the time, it hosted a small exhibition about the Easter Island, with works from its own collection. Each object was accompanied by a little text about how this object was now viewed differently because of recent research. Like, we thought this basket was woven this way, but it turns out to be that way. And that was so insightful to me. And with this idea, I now knew how to make a selection in the collection in the depot building. I didn't need a theme. I went searching among drawings, printings, prints and paintings and came across works about which I could tell a little bit more that the museum didn't know. And that's what we highlighted. So no theme, but the new knowledge of the research became the glue between them. This is a photo of the, the current presentation. Um, the lacquer panel that you saw before by Jaap Gidding it had been in the collection for some time, and we still don't really know how it un ended up there. But we do know now that it belonged to NSB leader Anton Mussert, which was quite interesting. There's also a drawing um, that I recognized as a preliminary, not a work, as a preliminary study of a mural made in 1941 in the then-new health building. Um, there was another drawing. Um, purchased by Boyman's director Hanema later in the war. And now, through research, we know that Hanema bought it because the artist had been deported to Germany and Hanema wanted to help Bezemer's wife, who had been left behind with no income, and so on. So that's, that's the new information, the glue between all those pieces. And there was a bit of a problem, though. This kind of info needs text, which was complicated precisely because a depot is not a museum. The presentations should not be too museum-like, and text makes it museum-like. The depot itself contains a lot of artworks that you look at purely by eye in a multitude there is, and if you need more, then there's a special depot app to download. But somehow we do have to give this info because otherwise people don't know what they're looking at. Um, and now that we decided to give extra information in the presentation, I wanted to seize the opportunity for something else, namely to ask questions. Oh yeah, this that's um um, well, it's an, another a photo of the exhibition. Um, the one in the front, the, um, the sunflowers, that's the, um, the drawing that I mentioned that Hanema bought uh, to help the artist's wife. Yeah, that one. For example, this is an artwork that I don't understand at all. Um, and I would hope that we can find someone who can tell us something about it. I know it was made by an artist called Jan Boom in 1944, who then also painted Still Life with Onions. The onions I understand, but I have no idea what I'm looking at here. Asking such questions in the presentation is not a random afterthought, because another aim of the project was crowdsourcing. When the depot building opened, Boymans intended to come into contact with the population of Rotterdam or elsewhere to collect information. It is a general wish of Boymans to come into contact with public in an active way and to approach the city from a reciprocal perspective, a two-way street. That wish of crowdsourcing was just as new as the depot building and I found it an idea that fitted in well with my research project. And that's because this subject of the war appeals to a broad audience. Art lovers, people interested in the war, or people interested in Rotterdam. 
and we had noticed this interest and accessibility at the previous exhibition in 2018, when many visitors came to me and others with stories about the war from their own families. That's information that can contribute to knowledge in this study. Also, we don't have forever to collect this information. Much of this knowledge is held by the children of those artists back then, and those children are also aging. So at some point in this century, we will lose them, and we will lose the opportunity to pick their minds. So like I said, crowdsourcing is a two-way street. You feed each other with insights. This mutual involvement provides support for a museum. With this research, we wanted to contribute something to the city, to bring to light a history that is underexposed in Rotterdam, something that interests people, and also it strengthens their bond with the museum. At the same time, crowdsourcing was new, and we still had to figure it out, and wondered when to start in this timeline of research not too late and not too early. And I had been working on the book for almost a year and a half when I wrote an article in the Rotterdam Supplement of NRC, my newspaper, in early 2022, an article in which I highlighted my research, including an email address, so that people could respond. And this resulted in some important contacts. I also went for a walk with the local radio station, Radio Raymond, along some places on the map that we were developing, which also received responses. But then afterwards I thought we were really too early with that walk, because the map was not yet online and we could not do much follow-up on it. So we lost momentum because of that. This is the map. And it went online this summer. And this is something that we consider a good platform for crowdsourcing. It contains 400 addresses of artists, art spaces, art in public space, and other main sites, covering the art world of 40, 45. There are also a few tours, which you can scroll through or use for an actual walk through the city. So for me, this is a living and growing archive. It contains my research, but it is also a tool for crowdsourcing. Before launching this map, in order to capture that momentum, we made a planning with the communication department of the museum on how to use the map and the presentation to increase public awareness and generate response. So we did this with a PR approach of press releases and social media posts in which we also included the questions for the population. And in order not to approach this too broad, we focused on a few small questions. For instance, who knows female artists who were active at the time in Rotterdam? Like who has an aunt or a grandmother who was painting back then? We added a button, button to the map, eh, insturen, for people to submit their own stories. And at the presentation, we announced a change that halfway through the duration of the presentation, we would add a display case with art, not from the museum collection, but from private owners, especially descendants of artists as part of the crowdsourcing. So that change will be next month. And all that info, all those new works, all those talks, everything can be added to the map. Crowdsourcing is a complementary research because it helps to add personal stories to a history or art history. It helps with a connection between the research and the public. It helps to build an overview of the enormous width of the art world of this occupied city. And even though it is dizzying a lot, for the map, the dizzying is only an asset. Because the more stories we have, the better. 
It would be too much for the book, but it would be great for the map. It's another screenshot. Um, because together, they show the energy of an art world under siege in an orderly manner. Well, um, crowdsourcing takes time. It is complicated. Also, because the war is complicated. You touch on all kinds of pain. I often meet, meet visitors in the presentation who carry intergenerational pain with them. The war is a very sensitive topic. And continuing with this research, I was aware that caution is required. This caution is for me a reason to act in a nuanced and lenient manner. And during the research, I noticed that I sincerely believe that it is good to judge mildly. And I do so for two reasons, the system and the fog. I'll explain, and that's my last bit. Yeah, okay. First, the system. Yes, the art system wasn't innocent. Art is visible, and this visibility was instrumentalized by the occupying forces for its propaganda. But that does not mean that the artists themselves were guilty of collaboration. Everyone had to make a living, whether you worked in a shop or a factory or, or an art studio. Artists were a small part within bigger forces. If you pinpoint the idea of guilt on just a few people who are not war criminals, then you forget the bigger picture, the system. That's where the problem lies. So that's the first reason I judge them out. And the second one is the fog as it was once described by novelist Milan Kundera. Kundera said that everyone's path in life is surrounded by fog. You don't see where you're going. You just do whatever seems best at the moment. And only later we can see where that path led. But when we look back in history at others, we see the choices people have made, but we never see the fog. And that makes it impossible to make a judgment afterwards. If you want to judge people's decisions, you cannot just look at the steps they took. You also have to try and see the fog that surrounded them at the time. That's it. Thank you. Very clear. It was extremely clear. It was wonderful. And I, I want to hear a question. What you did, Sandra, was you you developed, you added a collection to the depot. Yeah, in a way. Yeah. yeah. Or I added some knowledge to parts of the collection. collection yeah. And began to define it. Yeah. But we already have a question up oh, here. Oh, okay. Please go yeah. ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. I think it depends on, on, on the topic, really, that you're researching. If it has to do with 18th century French prints, then it's probably not so useful. But I think this history is so part of yeah, society still. And, and also, I thought, because in this case, um, a lot of stories, there was no attention for this part after 1945. And also this art that I showed uh, often hadn't left the depots for decades or sometimes they had never be sh been shown before. So there was a huge gap. And to fill that gap, in this case, the crowdsourcing was perfect. It's, it's good for the museum in a lot of ways because it also makes the connection stronger. And it also was something that well, usually I'm not a curator. I always write. And, and I, I wanted to feel this, this uh, personal touch. So, um, yeah, I think it, it, it does, it helped me a lot. Yeah. And vice versa, I hope. Because there are still uh, also descendants of artists who struggle with their 
um, the legacy of their parents, um, the legacy even having worked, what do you do with them if it's not museum worthy or if it's you don't know really what to do with it, how do you preserve that art history? It's something, it's, it's, it's felt uh, on a lot of levels, yeah. Um, well, I still have to, to make some appointments with uh, the people, really, but um, it's, um, it's usually, or it's mostly um, uh, drawings or drawing cahiers um, uh, that were made by artists uh, later in the war. So I'm in contact with a few um, children of artists who had been deported, um, not because they were Jewish, but because of the great Razia uh, at the end of 44. So they were deported to Germany and they managed to, to take some pencils with them. So those drawings I want to include. Also there's a sculpture that I want to include. Um, and yeah, well, that's, that's the main thing, yeah. I'm sorry, if, uh, what's the... Uh, was there a way that the shell was reflected in wartime art or not? No, 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 which is weird, really. Um, so, like I said, I'm lenient and I judge mildly, but on the other hand, there wasn't a lot of protest in the art world with, well, there was some, but, um, yeah, it's like it never happens. Um, Henk Chabot made his own paintings of also Jewish um, people in hiding. Um, and in a way you can say that portrait painting or portrait drawing is a way to act against uh, the Shoah because art was also made in concentration camps and by people in hiding. So art was a means portraiture as well, a means to show we are still here, we are still alive. But that's about it. So, um, yeah, there's no, uh, yeah. There's one print in the exhibition of, uh, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, of two people who were murdered on the ground. Yeah. But I, I yeah, yeah, but that was from 1950. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By an artist who has suffered as well. He wasn't Jewish, but his girlfriend was. And um, yeah, they had, had, had a tough time. And he later said, if you ask me what I did last year, I have no idea. But if you ask me what I did in 1945, I know of every day. So the war, the trauma continued. Yeah. Yes. So I just wonder in a sense too, because everybody creates visually the beautiful, but they archive the real visual memory, right? They exhibitionize the visual, but they also create some sort of like conscious audience. Yeah. Yes. It's a. <laughs> You said the, the archive, the map will stay online, so it's it's longer living archive than the presentation, which is only temporary. Yes, that's that's true. Um, I'm not sure how much I'm going to stay working on it in the future, but it will be online for forever, and <laughs> I hope. And yes, so uh, people can send in their stories, and I will moderate them, and I I hope I can continue when I find more info to, to publish it there and to make it even bigger. And the, it also, it feeds the energy because the more stories, the, um, the more that you see how lives, you know, people live parallel lives. 
that's yeah. Uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. And also, I'm not really finished with um, with, the <laughs> with the topic yet. So, well, we'll see how it uh, where it goes. Yeah. Yeah. And also the way that you're approaching this with crowdsourcing, but the, the general interaction and bringing also this project, which um, comes from collections inside the museum, but you're also bringing it out into the community yeah. and making those connections yeah. sort of physically. Yeah. Um, so it's also a kind of model for a contemporary museological practice, which... Yeah. Yeah, could yeah. be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, this has been really illuminating, and also I think you've made an extraordinary contribution Thank you. Um, to the museum, to the city of Rotterdam, to the, to the field of this particularly fraught moment. So I want to thank you, Sandra. Yeah, thank, thank you for having me. Thank you all thank for, you for coming. coming. Yeah. <laughs>